but awesome. So hello, I'm your host today. Uh, I am Ella and I was a former debate mate student. I did the core program at the Bridge Academy and then went on to study at Yale on a financial aid scholarship for three years. This year I'm taking a gap year and working full time for debate mate as an assistant program director, which means that I'll be running the graduate school program. And I know a lot of you in the room today are graduate school students, so I'm really looking forward to working with you over the next couple of months. And super excited to be able to host this webinar because like I said earlier, this is a panel entirely made up of former debate mate students, which is super cool. So that's a bit about me um, and how today is going to work is we're going to ask the panelists some questions about what it's like at Oxbridge and how you can apply to Oxbridge, what are their top tips, all those kinds of really important things. Um, and then that will last about an hour. And in the second hour, we'll move on to a Zoom room. And so you'll have a chance to meet uh, in smaller groups with one panelist and ask them a bunch of questions, uh, maybe more tailored to your application or where you are in the application process. And so without further ado, um, I'd like to go around and uh, have the panel introduce themselves. And so it would be great to hear what your names are and what your journey is. How did you get to Oxbridge? Um, so I'll start with Curran. How about you? Hi, yeah. Um, my name is, as you said, um, Curran. I, I did the core program at Robert Clack School. And I'm doing maths at Oxford right now. My journey for for getting to Oxford started with me thinking about whether or not I wanted to be an engineer because I was good at maths or if I wanted to be a lawyer because I was doing a lot of debate and then realizing that a degree is something that is going to be three years so I might as well make it fun and the thing that I found fun was maths um, and then doing more maths things doing research into what Oxford actually was and whether or not I wanted to take part of it until finally getting here after applying, doing everything. And, awesome. Yeah. And what college are you in? I'm at Wadham College and I'm doing my second year now. In, Great. Yeah. Uh, cool, thanks. Um, Danielle, what about you? Hi, I'm Danielle. Um, I did the Debate Mate Core Programme at Greycoat Hospital School in Westminster and then I did the graduate school for two years as well. Um, I'm studying music at Somerville College. Um, I kind of always knew that I wanted to study music so it's just a matter of like what within music I'd be doing. It wasn't until I got my GCSEs where I was kind of like looking towards more of an academic course in music and so um, Oxford was never really on the cards until sort of year 12 and then I just kind of like went into the application process with an open mind and here I am. Awesome. Louis? Uh, hi, I'm Louis. I study HCSS, which is social science, basically, at Sydney Sussex College in Cambridge. I went to Little Oxford School in East London, where I did the full programme, and then I did grad school for about two years. And I'm currently doing my first year, which I'm repeating. And I started off wanting to be a historian, because I really liked history, and it was something that I'd always really enjoyed. And then when I got to sixth form, I found out that Cambridge was really good for history, so I thought I may as well apply to see what happens. And I managed to get in, and then when I got there, I realised history really wasn't for me, and I was able to switch course about two, three weeks in. Awesome. Lydia. Hi, um, I'm Lydia. I'm going into my second year doing history and politics at University College Oxford. Um, so I uh, I initially started the core programme in like year eight at Buxton School. Um, in East London. Then I went to Brampton Manor for sixth form uh, and I also did the uh, grad school program I think starting like year 10 or 11. Um, so yeah initially I, I took history and politics because I thought I wanted to do law. It was like the same logic where it's like oh debating might as well just do law. Um, but then I realized I enjoyed history and politics in their own right as opposed to just like to get into law. Um, so I went for that and here I am. Awesome. Adam. I'll tell you myself. Um, hey everyone, my name is Adam. Um, I'm going into my second year at Oxford. 
um, at Teddy Hall studying history and politics. Um, I was a core program student back at Woolworth Academy in 2011 when I was in year seven um, and in year eight as well back in 2012. Um, ended up getting a full academic scholarship and bursary to go to Eton for sixth form, which is where I did A-levels in English, history and politics and Spanish for a year. I um, actually had a bit of a roundabout journey talk, so because I'd applied in year 13 after interviews, didn't end up getting in, actually to Lydia's college, university college, um, then took a gap year um, and then whilst on my gap year as well, worked at debate mate full time as an assistant program director for what Ella's doing now. Um, and reapplied successfully and now I'm at Teddy Hall going into my second year. Cool. Yola? Hello everyone, I'm Yola and I do medicine at St John's College, Oxford. I'm going into my third year now. Um, I went to Robert Clark School in Dagenham and I did the core programme with them, the same school as Quran. And I actually took part in the primary school programme when I was in a primary school in East London. Um, my journey to Oxford probably started, I would say, when I was in year 12 and I went on the unique summer school, which is a free summer school in Oxford. Um, and I really, really liked the university. Then I got my AS, AS grades and it looked like I could um, apply. And um, when I finally decided that I wanted to do medicine, I just decided to go for it. Great. Um, and finally, Edmund. Hey guys, my name's Edmund. I'm going into the third year of my maths degree at King's College, Cambridge. Um, I did a core program, the same as Ella, at Bridge Academy from year seven. And then uh, I went on, did the grad school until I, I left school and went to university. And then I mentored for a year or two years um, for the mate at a primary school in Hackney. Um, I started off my journey to Cambridge. Well, I always knew that I was going to do a maths degree because I, I always loved maths. Um, but Cambridge specifically started probably around about year 12 when I was first introduced by my um, excellent maths teacher uh, to the step, which is the maths um, Cambridge entrance exam. I love doing the questions. I really enjoyed um, uh, the step. I still do the questions to this day, and that was probably what sent me on the path to Cambridge and uh, ended up choosing it. Awesome. Um, so as you can see, we have a panel with a wide range of experiences here today. And so my first question to you all is um, quite a simple one. It's probably one that you've all, you know, been asked in your Oxbridge interviews, which is why Oxbridge and why did you choose Cambridge over Oxford or Oxford over Cambridge? Because um, what some of you might not know is that when you, it comes to applying to universities for UCAS, you can't apply to both Oxford and Cambridge, you have to choose one. Um, so how did you make that decision? Um, so I'll come first to Yola. What was your process in applying to Oxford? Um, so like I said, I went on the unique summer school and actually that summer I went to a summer school that was based in um, Cambridge as well with Sutton Trust. And so I got to see both cities directly and I guess Oxford was just more well suited to me, but obviously that's um, different for everybody. Something else that helped me choose Oxford was the fact that the entry grade requirements were lower for my course. I think it was A star AA at Oxford versus A star A star A at Cambridge, which to me felt like a more comfortable route to go down. Um, but other than that, like both universities kind of had the same reasons for me wanting to go. They were really high up for medicine and every subject, to be honest. Um, and yeah, like world-renowned universities, I knew that I would get to spend time with other people who had as much as a passion for my subject as I did. The collegiate system was appealing to me. I thought it would be something really unique. And of course, the tutorial systems, I thought it would be really exciting to get to have that form of teaching. Yeah, definitely. Um, Louis, what about you? Um, so originally I also did the unique summer school for a different degree, which is like history related. And I went there and I realised at the time it actually wasn't the type of atmosphere I liked in Oxford. So I applied to Cambridge instead for just history because it was better at it than Oxford. And when I got to I think the same thing applies, but I really enjoy the idea of having one-on-one -on -one teaching with experts in the field. And also, if you're thinking about doing like a social sciences degree, I don't think Oxford has an equivalent of HSCS yeah, as it was in Cambridge. I'm quite lucky that I ended up going to Cambridge and I can do the degree I'm doing now. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so uh, I know a lot of you have said that a big draw is that one-on-one -on -one tutoring, the tutorial system, um, a lot of college universities, you were going to be in big lectures, big seminars, but Oxford and Cambridge, you get more personalised time 
with professors. Um, Lydia, what about you? Uh, what made you choose Oxford over Cambridge? Um, so funny enough, uh, the summer before year 13, I was completely set on applying to Cambridge, um, but unique and I just really liked well, actually, one of the reasons was because, you know, Oxford felt like a London, it's like always so busy and stuff, but like Oxford felt like a little bit more turned down, <laughs> which was nice. Um, and Cambridge, really pretty and stuff, but it just felt like it wasn't big enough for, for me. So I went with um, Oxford instead. So you can see there are loads of reasons, um, quite personal, why people chose that, whether that's the course they wanted, the grade requirements being slightly less at Oxford sometimes, or just wanting uh, to live in a particular city. Um, and so I, Yola mentioned one thing that drew her to Oxford was um, the college system, this collegiate system where you have to apply to a college in Oxford and not just Oxford University. Um, and so Karen, why uh, did you choose the college you chose and how did you go about deciding what college to choose? Do colleges matter when you get to Oxford and Cambridge? Um, so I mean, to start off the first part of like how I chose, how I chose my own college, I started off making a spreadsheet about what does each college have. So I was like, okay, I want, I want to have a kitchen. So how many kitchens are shared between this many people? Like, no, how many people are sharing each kitchen? It's not we don't have multiple kitchens per person. It's not like that. Um, or are you allowed to walk on the park, like on the grass areas? Because for me, I kind of felt like if your college is saying we, we don't want to use the grass, I thought that was a bit too stuffy for my tastes and stuff like that. The sort of vibes that you get from there and the alternative perspective is really good for that. I ended up looking at two colleges that I narrowed down that were just the worst colleges for diversity statistics. So I threw, I threw the spreadsheet in the bin afterwards. And I ended up choosing Wadham because it's the area that it's the it's the college that supports my borough in getting people to Oxford. So Oxford has each college has a specific borough in London and a specific region in outer London that chooses that they want to support getting people inside inside Oxford or or Cambridge too. And Wadham was the one for me, so that's why I chose that. On whether or not it matters, I'd say that can matter to an extent, but I wouldn't necessarily think about, oh, this college is too stuffy for me, I won't, I won't belong there. Because um, that's the thing that I thought beforehand. But actually, um, because there are so few people in a college, you will make up a good chunk of the demographic of that college. So if you feel comfortable being yourself despite who you're with, I think, it, I think you can find a way of belonging there, which works out. I might say that, especially now, things like kitchen facilities might matter a lot with colleges. So there's a, a big difference in the treatment. So some colleges that I know have no kitchen facilities at all this year, and some are quite good with that. So maybe bear that in mind. Uh, yeah, definitely. So the culture of a college um, might matter to you if it has kitchen facilities versus if you might have to go and eat in the dining hall and spend loads of money in the dining hall. All these things are things you might want to think about. Danielle, what about you? Do you think your college matters? Um, how did the picking a college work for you? Um, I think that, so um, when it comes to music and like the application process, colleges do happen to be like really important um, because kind of just generally because of like the chapel and um, Anglican music culture in Ox Oxbridge generally. So you might have some colleges where like they have a greater emphasis on like chapel music. And so if you're an organ scholar or a choral scholar, it's worth applying to those as opposed to others where they're like kind of a bit more funky and free spirited. Um, so I had a bit of a like dramatic sort of finding my way around colleges in Oxford so I originally applied to St Hilda's um, because my head of sixth form was like well maybe you should apply to St Hilda's because they're a bit more funky and my personal statement was very funky it was very you know niche and me and not the Oxford type at all so then um, the way that music interviews work they always interview at a second college as well so I applied to St Hilda's had the interview there 
Then I had the standard second interview at Hartford. And then on the like third day, I was told to stay an extra day in Oxford. And then I ended up having a pooled interview at St. John's. So when I had the pooled interview at St. John's, I interviewed with the tutor at St. John's and the tutor at Somerville, which is the college that I'm at now. And so um, I received my original offer from St. John's. And then on results day, I was pulled to Somerville. So that's how I ended up at Somerville. It was very, you know, long-winded, lots of moving around. Um, but usually a lot of people often always say that, like, um, with their experiences with being pulled, they're so much happier at the um, college that they are at now. And I think the same, I, I can say the same as well. I think um, it was kind of scary, like the idea of going to a college that you've not interviewed at and like the fact that you might not know anyone. Um, and like the diversity in John's in our year group is not that great. Like I'm friends with the only black person in the year. So like it's been, I think she found it like quite difficult kind of making friends and all that kind of stuff. And um, I think in my college, I was able to like make friends and like, I have like a group of ACS friends in my college as well. So that was great. Um, I think like one thing to bear in mind in terms of like picking colleges and all that kind of stuff, you might like kind of be feel scared of like the big colleges and you know the ones that have like these names that politicians have gone to like the Christchurch, the Balliols and like the diversity statistics will be scary with the bigger ones because that's where you know like people want to go to the public schoolers want to go to the um the big colleges but I think that like also bear in mind like the fact that people are from London or from cities where they've like experienced diversity before is a really good thing. Like I found in my college, um, as much as it's like such a friendly college and everyone's really lovely, a lot of people like actually just genuinely have not met people from ethnic minorities before. So like having to kind of explain certain things that you'd want people to know already can be quite tiring, but you might not have that same experience in the bigger colleges that have the people from like the inner cities that will have kind of experienced diversity and understand sort of the things that you say and like the cultural references and stuff like that. Yeah, thank you, Danielle. Um, Edmund, how would you say the college system works at Cambridge? Do you think colleges matter? So I personally think they don't. Um, I, I kind of agree with Danielle said earlier when she said um, it doesn't matter where you end up, you're going to end up loving it. I think that's true. They're all, all the colleges are Cambridge. Uh, and to some degree, where you end up, you end up loving it and thinking it's the best college because of confirmation bias, but also because it like partly shapes you and you partly grow to, to like fit the atmosphere of that college, which is really nice. Um, but given that, when I was going into applying, I kind of just took a very pragmatic approach. I just decided, okay, which is the college that I'm most likely to get into and I'll apply there. So King's obviously has the chapel um, and gets a lot of applicants because of the chapel, but like that was very much not a factor in me applying. I applied because uh, they have a very high stage score representation, uh, something like 80%, uh, and they give contextual offers, which I ended up needing. So um, that's why I applied to, uh, to King's. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think at the end of the day, it, it's all Cambridge. Some of them have like small advantages, some have small disadvantages. They end up not mattering. What matters is the friends you make there and that is not something you can control not something you can pick based on the colleges they're all random wherever you go so um yeah that's that's why i ended up making that decision great thanks um and so moving on to life at oxbridge uh we already heard some of what it's like uh from danielle and how there might be an oxbridge type um adam how have you found life at oxbridge now you're there um do you think there is an oxbridge type and what has your experience been? Um, yeah, so I've, I've had a really good time so far. I've really enjoyed my first year. Um, it's kind of ended in a bit of a whirlwind, especially given COVID. Um, and I'm sure those of you on the webinar who are in year 11 and year 13 especially will know. Um, so yeah, so I've, I've really enjoyed it. I think in terms of like an Oxbridge type, I don't think that there is per se. I think quite often when we speak about Oxford or we, when we speak about Cambridge, like two people can go to Oxford and have quite different experiences. And I don't think that Oxford in and of itself like is a monolith and people have like the same experiences. I think there's lots of kind of like little Oxfords, if you will, like within Oxford, depending on like what societies people choose to join 
depending on what sports people play, um, depending on how into music they are, for instance, and like lots of other things, drama, plays, theatre. Um, I think people experience different Oxfords in a sense. Um, for me, um, thing, the main things that I've gotten really involved in, sorry, my thing froze for a sec, sorry, my thing froze. Um, the main things that I've gotten really involved in are like the union and like debating there, um, but also getting involved in like, the organizing of events. Um, I go to a lot of ACS events, so African Caribbean Society events. Um, I do a lot of college sports, so I play college football and rugby. Um, so I've like got stuck into lots of the different parts of it and I've really enjoyed it so far. Um, I'd, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Let somebody else on. Yeah. Great. Uh, Lydia, how are you finding Oxbridge? What's it like now you're there? Um, well, physically, not yet, but I'll be there soon. <laughs> um, I think, well, I <laughs> how, like, how is it generally? I think I'm loving it. Obviously, it's not, I, it's not perfect, uh, but it's home for me. Um, I think uh, I was also lucky enough to know some people already going there. Funny enough, from debating uh, and like debate mate and stuff. Um, I think I, it's it's like a great I, for me. It was like a great opportunity to meet like people like me as well. Um, I think you know going back to the idea of the Oxford type. Although there may be people who may like you know be the majority or whatever. I think you will still find your people there. Um, which is, I think, is the most important thing. Um, I think even if if you think, you know, oh, there's not many people like me, like there's not many, you know, POC or many like queer people or whatever. Um, I actually found that, you know, even though you might think that the majority aren't like you, all it means is that like the smaller groups are just more cozy and more like friendly. Um, so I, I would say I found it like quite good. Obviously it has its ups and downs, but you know, with the people that I met, with the friends that I made, and the things that I take part in and stuff like that, um, it's great. Great, thanks. Um, Louis, uh, looking more at like the academic life at Oxbridge, um, could you speak more to like maybe how Oxbridge is different to maybe other universities or what you see your friends at other universities experiencing how what is a day in the life of an Oxbridge student and how academically might that be different to if you attended a different UK university? Um, well sorry I'm speaking on very much a humanities perspective so obviously I can't really be the expert on science and STEM subjects and music as well to be honest but um, but I think the one thing you need to I think the one thing is that the workload is very, very, it's a lot, like it's a lot, and it's very condensed because Oxford has like eight week terms. So you do a lot of work in a really short amount of time. So for me, when I was doing my first year HSPS, I was doing 12 essays in the term, so it's like two or three in a week, depending on like how much, where, where things come around. And I think, especially for humanities, a lot of it is you are sitting by yourself in the library doing a lot of reading because you have very little contact hours, you have like one or two lectures a week. So it's very, it's a lot more independent than I'd say other subjects so you don't really have. And then the next other, other things you might be used to because at least for me it's like six or seven people are quite like handheld of like, we're doing this for this time, this week, if you don't do it, you'll get attention. This time they're just kind of like, why didn't you do your essay on time? And it's like, there's not really that much of a repercussion for it. So it's very much, you have to, um, mind yourself for it but I think it's quite important that you get to teach yourself how to be independent because uh, it helps you keep yourself on track and it's quite it's really useful just to be able to like organize yourself to get stuff done obviously it's not going to be perfect but you have to like try and learn it yourself and everyone kind of gets put in the same place so it's not like you're by yourself struggling alone everyone else is struggling at kind of the same pace so you can bond over that it's a good way of making friends I'd say yeah mm -hmm. Great. Yola, how have you found life at Oxbridge, both academically and socially? 
I'll start off with academics. Um, I'll tell you my experience is probably the complete opposite. Um, I do medicine, so I feel like the story is probably the same for like all medical schools in the UK, but probably at Oxford is just a bit more emphasised, but I have a lot of contact hours. I've got lectures more or less every day, usually more than one, maybe two or three. We've got a couple of labs a week, a couple of tutorials a week, and that takes up a lot of your time. And then on top of that, um, at Oxford Medicine, you have to write essays throughout the week. That's um, how your knowledge is tested. And so it can be quite busy, but once you learn how to manage your time, it's fine. And I feel like in my personal experience anyway, um, like my routine in A-levels, I was working a lot. So it wasn't something that I wasn't used to. Um, I would say that like when I came to Oxford, I became less independent in my learning. Like I replied, I relied on other people a lot more than I used to, which is actually quite kind of nice. Um, Cause I, I feel like at sixth form, I just kind of did my own thing and got by on my own, but it's kind of nice to like learn how to work in groups and um, like learn from other people as opposed to just a teacher. Um, in general, not too bad. You get used to the workload. At times it can be like really tough. At times it can be quite easygoing. So I guess like there's loads of ups and downs, but it's to be expected. In terms of like social life, to be honest, I can't complain. Um, I'm really lucky. I met really amazing people on my course and in my college. A lot of people from similar backgrounds to me, a few people who aren't from similar backgrounds to me. Um, and so I feel like, especially because before I came to Oxford, I was really worried about all of these things. I was actually very pleasantly surprised with all of the friendships that I formed at Oxford. So it's been nice for me. And also um, college and medicine does loads of events. And to be fair, loads of things are going on, on in Oxford all the time. There's like loads of dinners, loads of gatherings. I'm not Obviously now it's because of COVID, it probably will be different. But um, my point is like, you do do things outside of academics, even with a subject like medicine. Awesome. Um, and so moving on to the crux of this, uh, panel discussion, which is the actual application. Um, and so the first thing you have to do in an application to any UK university, and Oxford is not an exception, is the personal statement. Um, so Corin, how important is the personal statement when applying to Oxbridge and how do you make yours stand out? Um, so I guess I'll start by saying that very few people, at least for maths, got asked about their personal statement during the interviews. So I think what I was told by a third year was that they might use it to get you comfortable, to make sure that you're in the best mindset, you're not stressing out during the interview. But for the most part, it's, it's, not, gonna, it's not going to factor in positive, positively, positively massively, but you want it to be good because you don't want to give them any reasons to exclude you because of the personal statement. So that's what I heard. Like you don't want to, don't mess it up, but it doesn't, yeah, that's, that's the main thing. And in terms of making it stand out, I think one of the things that I remember being told in Taste Today's and one of the things that I've seen a few students I've been talking to sort of do that they maybe shouldn't do is try to say, try to say the most impressive thing. Try to say that, oh, I know about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, I'm doing my research on it, which is a very difficult thing to be doing. Um, trying to show off what you know instead of show off what you're trying to get to know more. And so I guess one of the ways that I think I stood out in the interview having talked to my tutor afterwards and or just got my vibes from him is showing that, oh yeah, these are things that I'm really confused about. And it's normal to be confused about these things because, because I'm not afraid to push myself. And maybe that's, a, I think that's a useful thing to be showing. Awesome, thank you. Um, Lydia, do you have any tips for the personal statement? As a humanities student, how important is the personal statement and how do you make it stand out? Um, I think the personal statement is, you know, contrary to STEM, it's quite important in the humanities. Um, yet we've also got, you know, admissions tests and stuff like that, but the personal statement is what will get, will give the tutors an opportunity to look at you as a person and your academic interests um specifically so i think the best way to like the best advice i think i've been given in terms of personal statements is to not just to blindly list everything you've done because i mean you know the fact that you've gotten to the point where you're applying probably means you've done you know you've read many books or you've 
taking part in many projects or you're hearing like you're listening to all these podcasts but the most important thing is showing that you're thinking beyond that and so it's it's more impressive to focus on say even if you're talking about you know one or two or three specific ideas or theories for example that you're discussing and dissecting and questioning would be way more impressive than you listing all these things that you've learned um and in terms of uh again when you're talking about these things uh, and this is where like the best advice bit comes in it's when you show that you've uh taken in, like independent steps to learn more so for example i went to this like lecture like public lecture and that was speaking about this and this thing very like uh, interested me so i read this book and now i'm writing about this theory like on, on this personal statement i think um that shows lots of commitment to the subject and genuine interest and also a willingness to engage with it beyond the curriculum um so yeah and yeah try to kind of tie back tie everything back to to the subject when it comes to to oxbridge and yeah little tip if you've got like lots of activities or something that you can't exactly tie on your personal statement just ask your tutors to list that in your reference um which is what i've done um i just kind of gathered all the stuff that didn't fit in and gave it to my teacher and i was like okay please just find somewhere to put it inside um and yeah that's what i've done so thank you yeah that's a really good tip um and i also I uh, really like the point about public lectures, um, especially if you're from London or Manchester, you know, you're in a big city, obviously in COVID that might be hard, but maybe there are a lot of public lectures online that you can attend, but, um, you know, you, most of them are free and that's a really good way to show you have interest and expertise outside of the curriculum. Um, Yola, as a medic, would you say that the personal statement is important? And what tips would you give um, medics who are writing a personal statement? In medicine, I would say it's definitely important, but don't get too caught up on it because I feel like I need, always needed to remind myself that every part of your application is viewed in its own right, is holistic, so nothing is going to take precedence. Like, your interview is going to shape one opinion of you, your grades will shape another opinion of you, so remember that your personal statement is like part of this like whole big thing that you're giving them but that being said um i would say when you're applying to oxford or cambridge you need to have like a scientific component in your personal statement at least that's what i was told that's what all of my friends that are medics did as well um because the first three years you're not really going to be doing medicine you're doing a science degree and so you need to show them that you know you care about research I guess or like at least make them think that um, that you like science that you know you appreciate everything that comes before learning actually how to be a doctor um, that's the main thing I would say the way that I showed that was like doing courses online I would just like um, find something that I found interesting in my science lessons and maybe research something related to it online maybe watch a lecture on it maybe read a book about it just to show you're involved in the science component but then also remember you're still applying to medicine, so don't forget about um, normal work experience, normal things to show your internet personal skills, maybe things that you do on the side as well. Um, I know this varies from tutor to tutor, but I know that in the grand scheme of things, they all do remind themselves that these are future doctors that are coming in. So they do want you to be well-rounded at Oxford and Cambridge as well. Uh, one thing I would say that I did that um, was really helpful was like a free future learn course online. Um, they're literally free. You can choose whatever you want. There's loads of different courses that are loads of different lengths. So you can choose a really short one if you're pressed for time. Um, and then that can show like that you've been interested in your academics outside of school. Awesome. Great tip with free future learn. And I think Coursera is another similar one where if you want um, to take a free course, you can do that as well. Um, so that's a whistle stop tour through the personal statement. Moving on to the aptitude tests. So everyone who applies to Oxford and Cambridge has to take a test related to the subject they apply to, whether that's uh, the MAT or the UK CAT, or they all have different names depending on your subject. Um, and so I was wondering, um, Adam, if you could tell us a bit more about these aptitude tests. What do they test? How do they work? But also, how can you prepare for them as an Oxbridge applicant? Yeah, so I think the main point of the aptitude test is that it tries generally on as level a playing field as possible, in inverted commas, um, to try and kind of have some kind of benchmark for everyone. 
um, and like compare everyone against the same kind of standard. So if in the court, in the kind of case of history, for instance, for Oxford, it's called the history aptitude test. Um, and I think it's called the same thing for Cambridge as well, but it more or less tries to test in essence your degree of like historical imagination. So how you think about something that you've never seen before you get given a random source. Um, there's been bizarre ones in the past from like dog headed monks and like ship inventories in the 15th century and like the most obscure history that nobody would have ever studied before, presumably. Um, and they just want you to kind of use your historical imagination to try and make sense of it. So I think the main point of it is to try and gauge how able you are to think on your spot, at least in the case of the history aptitude test, um, how able and willing you are to kind of think on the spot, on the spot, <coughs> to not be phased by um, things that you haven't necessarily encountered before. Um, in terms of preparation for it, what I'd recommend is past papers. I can't stress this enough. They're literally all available online. Um, you can get tons of them, them online. Literally practice all the past papers. Try and go through all of the past papers. Leave a couple for just before the exam as well, like a week before, two weeks before, um, and kind of practice those ones then so they're kind of unseen. Um, get feedback from your teachers. Try and get them to look, look through it for you. Some of the other actually tests are more kind of multiple choice type questions. I know for the TSA, for instance, for those of you who are maybe thinking about applying to Oxford for PPE, um, you have to do the TSA. It's in two sections. Section two um, is basically writing an essay more or less. Um, but the, the more important part is the section one, which is multiple choice thinking skills assessment, um, test things like critical thinking, the way in which you reason through things. Um, but and you can mark that yourself quite easily um, if you kind of practice that. There are books that you can get as well. Um, none of them come to mind right now, but there are like kind of guides and stuff online. And there's a, a lot of resources online, even if you Google advice for this particular exam, people who have written kind of a lot of detail in a lot of detail about that particular exam. But practice is the most important thing. So I went on quite a bit, but. No worries. That was all super important information. Um, going to Edmund, as um, someone who did STEM and did the step in order to get in, how did you find that process and do you have any other advice for the aptitude tests? Yeah, so uh, I did a step which is sat at the end of um, the summer at the same time after all, yeah, there was a finished, which obviously makes it quite a different beast to a lot of the aptitude tests that other subjects do. Um, it, it can't, it, it's a strange thing. I think most mathos or mathematicians at Cambridge um, have a very love-hate relationship with it because it's, it's it's really enjoyable and really fun. It's also really really hard, and by the time you're starting it, it's it seems like a really insurmountable task because you, you you get like step two and three questions that would be like um, beginning of year thirteen. You think there's no way I can do this, but you really do just have to keep practicing, keep plugging through, and eventually you'll get to the point by the end of year thirteen that you are just living and breathing step. So I never said that. I never used to say that I took three A-levels and step, I took one A-level and step, right? Because I took maths and further maths and then I took the step, but those two things are essentially the same. Like I, all the content revision I did for maths and further maths, I just did step questions as a revision for that, um, which made that kind of easier in breaking that down. Um, what else is there to say? I think our equivalent of the aptitude test that is normally sat in October, like the mat and stuff, is the uh, interviews, because the interviewers care about your maths and about how good you are at maths, they don't really care about anything else. Um, and so that is essentially like another aptitude test. And I, you have to revise for that in the same way you would for an, for an aptitude test. In fact, in for Kings, they do give you a test to sit on interview day, um, which meant that I ended up doing some math pass papers as well um, to, to practice for that. And like, like Adam says, there is no shortcut for it really. You just have to do lots of pass papers. And that is how you do maths revision really. It's just, you, you take a question, you think, okay, did I get this? Uh, can I do the question? Yes. Okay, fine. Brilliant. Move on. If it's no, you have to ask yourself, well, did I, can I not do this because of a simple mistake or because of like a conceptual misunderstanding? And if it's a simple mistake, then you have to think, okay, fine. I need to practice this more. It, it's, it's, it was something that will come in the future. If it's not, then you need to go back to the drawing board, start looking at content again. I start looking at similar questions and, and easier questions and you can do those. Um, but yeah, the steps are obviously highly specific and only need to worry about it if you're applying to Cambridge. So. Uh, great, thank you. And so moving on to the interviews, um, 
with that. Um, obviously, for a lot of students, the interview is the scariest part of the application. You are in a room with um, Oxford and Cambridge scholars. Um, and so I was wondering, Danielle, could you like, uh, obviously you study music, so it might be specific to your degree, but what is the interview like? Is it as scary as people think? What are they testing you for? And do you have any tips for the interview? Yeah, so I think I'll try and kind of like give the general takeaways just because music might be like something that nobody here is thinking about. Um, so I ended up sitting three interviews. So I've seen kind of like the different ways that they go. Um, I think my general advice for interviews would be kind of always try and ex think out loud, always try and s say what you're thinking, because I think that um, tutors are kind of like, they're not really that, they, if they really cared about teaching, they would be teachers, they're tutors, because like, they want to write books, they want to like, engage with people who are interested and people who want to learn. And so I think the whole point of the interview is, especially within the humanities, like, making it clear to them that you'd be a fun person to teach, like you'd have interesting conversations with them in tutorials. So it's about like not being afraid to ask questions um, if you're not sure or like making sure that you kind of think out loud. Don't be afraid to get things wrong because they're not expecting you to know everything. Like They're scholars who have done tens of years of work in a field and you're kind of 17, 18. Like they just want you to be open and willing I think also um, another thing is to like, um, yeah, always interviews. I think my favorite interview was the last interview that I went to. And I think that was because I had gone in with the mindset of, I'm just going to have a really fun conversation with people who know loads about music, which is a subject that I love. And I think when you go into it with that mindset, it helps you to kind of like be less nervous, helps you to do all the things that everyone reminds you of, think out loud, ask questions, be interested, because you genuinely are interested. So um, if you're feeling nervous, definitely kind of like, instead of seeing it as like this really big weight on like this getting into Oxford, try and see it as this great opportunity to talk to some experts about a subject that you're really interested in. Yeah, great. Um, and Louis, what would you say about the interview? How did you find the interview and what tips would you give? So um, in Cambridge, interviews are normally open only, only on one day or like maybe you have to stay over because it's quite late. So you don't have to wait as long a time as in Oxford and it's normally only done in one college generally, so the one you apply to. So for me, interviews were like, I had to get up really early because I had like the first interviews of the day at like eight o'clock. So I was like, in the car at like five or something, I can't remember. And I think a couple of takeaways or things I think were useful to me, the first and most important thing is for humanity students, read your personal statement before you do your interview because you'll get caught out if you don't. So I got caught out because I thought I knew what I'd written about and they asked me a question on it and I sit there and try and think of the most, similar, like sounding legit, but actually just completely came out of my head thing I could. And I think doing debate rate actually quite help, was quite helpful for that because um, obviously if you put your information it catches you off guard so you can think on the spot so don't put yourself into that situation because it's quite stressful and when I gave that answer I was looking back on it when I got out of the interview and I was like kicking myself I was like how could I not how could I just not done that um, the thing that I think is actually quite useful is if is actually look up who they are and what they do because if you show your interest in what they do because at the end they sometimes ask if you've got any questions so I looked up my interviewers on like the faculty website and it said what they did their PhDs in or like what they were supervising people in and I just asked oh because I was actually genuinely interested like what is the point of the history of like um questionnaires I think I thought one of the interviews I was doing was um doing research in, and I was like actually quite interested in finding out like what he actually got from that so I think showing your interest in what they do as well is good and like building a rapport and it's okay to like just say can I have a minute to think because if you just start talking and keep going you might end up losing your train of thought. So yeah, um, top tips, one, read your personal statement, two, have a chat about what they do, and three, um, it's okay to stop and think. Yeah, that's about it. Sorry, can I just add something to that? Go for it. Um, yeah, I think uh, what Louis said about uh, like looking up what the 
what like they specialize in i think that's pretty great but also make sure that you you'd actually be interested in talking about that because you know like he mentioned i think it was questionnaires louis was it like they history of questionnaires or something so that's we can see that's something quite thematic so it would be quite fun to talk about but like if your tutor is interested in like 12th century pilgrims or something um don't talk about that just because it's their thing because they have like you know a lot of experience and a google search isn't gonna cut it if it's not something that you actually want to talk oh, about um, i meant sorry i think i came across this badly i think it meant you have to like ex -arc, like tell them to like tell you what it's about so like right at the yeah, yeah, yeah. Issues, no, 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 that makes sense yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's okay. just like i remember like, like a lot of us like when we got our interviews like trying to look up um like their their specialties and we we're like okay calm down guys don't don't try to have a debate with them about this oh but, yeah yeah never do that never try and debate into you because you'll just embarrass yourself yeah some great tips there um i think the main takeaway from that is uh definitely don't pretend you're interested in you know a tutor's issue if you're not or like research loads but at the same time you know ask them questions you both share a love of a particular subject even if you don't share a love of that niche so like Danielle said it's a conversation as well as an interview so don't be scared to ask them things you're genuinely interested in and show that um, capability and interest uh, cool and so in the last five minutes I just wanted to save these five minutes um, to ask every one of the panelists um, if you could go back um, in time to your year 12 year 13 self uh, what advice would you give to yourself um, thinking about the Oxbridge application? Or um, if you think you did everything amazingly and you wouldn't give yourself advice, um, what advice would you give to the students in this room um, that you wouldn't have known until you got to Oxbridge and not realised? Um, so we can pick your brains and all your knowledge as current Oxbridge students. Um, and so I'll just go around the, the screen. Um, so Curran, what would advice would you give to current students slash your past self? Yeah, um, I guess one piece of advice that I give is at, at least at Oxford, you're definitely going to be given more work than you can handle because if you can handle the amount that you're meant to be given, they'll just give you more. So when you're choosing to apply, really decide which of these zones is comfortable for you? Like, do you want to be in a position where I know I can keep on pushing as much as I want and I'll choose when to, when I've had enough? Or do you want to be in a position where, oh, I'll do as much as I need to and then I can do, then I can do social stuff? Because there's a few people, I suffered this in first term, who were like, I'm going to get everything 100% and then I'll relax. But that's not going to happen because whenever you get close, it's going to add something more to it. So noticing that that's the big difference to me at least wouldn't it would it would have reassured me of my choice and it may either reassure you of wanting to apply to oxbridge or make you think maybe that's not my style so that's yeah. my main thing awesome adam um cool um a few points um firstly i'd say something that i definitely say is um I think a big part of it, at least like being an Oxford student now, a big part of it is like keeping lots of plates spinning or like trying to keep lots of plates spinning or perhaps more truthfully trying to look like you're keeping more plates spinning than you actually are. Um, I think over time you get like better at that and you get better at being able to manage things and juggle things and prioritise things. Um, what I'd also say as well, I think it's a bit tricky for me, like, and this might be overly personal, but if I were to give advice to my like year 12, year 13 self, because I'd, I'd applied in year 13 unsuccessfully and then ended up reapplying on my gap year. Um, the advice or like, the, what I would say to my year 12 self, my like 16, 17 year old self, who's like applying for the first time would be like, just because one door closes doesn't mean like the other doors won't open in the future. Um, so I think optimism, but also kind of keeping a level head continuously is really important. I think the second time when I applied, and I think this is the major difference for me, I was just a lot more comfortable and just a lot more at ease with myself and like in my knowledge and was just a lot more able to just speak about things that I was interested in 
um, and not be awkward or afraid or overly timid or overly hesitant, for instance. And I think that's what made the world a difference. So like keep being involved in the debate, mate. keep practicing the kind of 21st century skills. Um, and yeah, that's what I'd say. Thank you. Louis. Um, I think I have two pieces of advice for myself. One from when I'm up, hopefully one from when I was applying. I think when I was applying, I think the thing I'd say to myself is that just because you're good at a subject doesn't mean you necessarily like it a lot. So I think I was good at history and I thought, oh, because well, I'm good at history, I must like it when it comes to degree. But when I got to my degree, I was like, oh my God, this is awful. I genuinely don't like it at all. So I think it's okay to shop around for degrees that they don't do as an A-level, but they do do at the university because they actually might be more interesting than what you'd have to break through as an A-level. And I think that's something I'd say to myself when I was in year 12 and 13, that's fine. And then at the university, I think, I'd say it's okay to ask for help. So I got quite sick when I was in my first year of university in about January, February time. And I thought I could push through it myself and then ended up like having to, my friends were like, you need to go to go and talk to like some academic staff. So I talked to them and then they said, oh, if you want to take time out of your studies to like just look after yourself and then come back in, it's okay to do that. So I think they do actually care about your well being, even if people are like, oh, there's so much stress, there's so much workload. They do, I mean, they do care about your well being because they want you to do your best as you can. I think, yeah, it's okay to ask for help for people when you're at uni if you're struggling, even if it seems like everyone else is struggling as well, because you might be struggling in different ways. Yeah, some great advice there. Lydia? Um, I think similarly to Louis, I'll probably give two pieces, one for before applying and one for after. Um, both to do with the same thing, and it's uh, look after your mental health. Don't, be, don't burn yourself out. I know, you know, I think, you know, even if you're not a stressed person, um, the process is a lot, you know, it's, it's very emotionally draining. I found it, um, you know, you have to do all these stages and you become like quite attached to it. Um, and so what I'd say is, yeah, don't be so hard on yourself. Um, know that it's, it's not the be all and end all. Uh, it's not like, like heaven, <laughs> you know, I think there's many places where you can thrive socially and academically. Um, and sometimes they're not Oxford or Cambridge and that's okay. And sometimes they might even be better for you. Like do question whether it is, if, whether it's good enough for you and your learning style and your ambitions and what you enjoy. And don't only question if you're good enough for it. Um, and I think that extends to being there as well. I know, like for me, I, you know, went through year 13, completely burnt myself out, started year, like first year of uni in that state, trying to, you know, as Adam said, keep all the plates spinning and they weren't spinning. <laughs> um, so for that version of myself, I'd say just like ask for help, like it's fine. Uh, you can, like there's many people that deal with welfare, with, uh, you can register with like the disabilities people, for, like the disability advisory service with like, for like, if you have anything with like mental health and difficulties um, and you will get the support that you need. You just have to go out there and get it, which can be hard, but it's worth doing. Um, so yeah, just look after yourself. Great, Yola? Um, I think for me, if I could go back, I just wish I would tell myself to have more confidence. Like every step of my Oxford application, like I genuinely thought that I was like the worst of the bunch and I was really convinced by it. So it would be something so simple. Someone would talk about their work experience and I'd like my gut would like clench and I'd be like, oh my God, I haven't got any work experience similar to that. I'm not going to get in. Or someone would say the most obvious facts. But in my head, it was the smartest thing I've ever heard in my life. And I was like, there's no way. How can I compete with that person? And that energy even came through to first year for me. I had such bad imposter syndrome, which is basically when, for me anyway, it was thinking that everybody else knew a lot more than me. And the reason I say, like, I wish I had more confidence is because I think I could have got a lot more out of, like, my teaching. Remember, at Oxford like and Cambridge, you're in these small groups. Um, talking to a tutor you need to speak up you need to be confident in what you're saying and you know have faith in your opinion because if not if you're withdrawn then you haven't got like the maximum from that experience and you know that's the reason why I chose Oxford I wanted that learning style so I just wish I had more confidence the whole way it would have been like a much easier process to go through 
and also there was no real reason for me to doubt myself to the level that I did so if you're considering Oxford you've clearly got like the potential to get in you've got the grades to get in there's a reason or Cambridge sorry there's a reason why you're considering it so just have faith in the fact that you're a very viable candidate um, and you do have a chance no matter how much you convince yourself like how big the chance is is still there Great. Edmund. Uh, so similar to Yela, I think, um, I think you, the most important thing to a generic maths applicant is you don't have to be an IMO medalist to get in. Like the step seems insurmountable when you start off. It's a steep learning curve. It is, but you will get to the top of the curve and eventually uh, you, you'll be looked back and wondering why you ever even worried uh, about it. Um, I think to a specific, talking to a specific Edmund three years ago, um, I'd probably say, what are you doing? apply for computer science. That's just because you haven't done a formal qualification in that subject doesn't mean that it's the right for you. And just because you're good at maths doesn't mean that that's the right degree for you. Um, I do love maths still, but I think I'd probably be better off if I was doing a computer science degree. And I probably will end up in a career in that anyway, but that's, you know, it's probably a discussion for a different webinar. Thank you. And finally, Danielle. Yeah, I think um, the same with everyone, I'll do like the two things. Um, I think like on this point of like looking after yourself in terms of the application process, one thing that I was happy that I did, maybe because I'm a perfectionist that has a fear of failure, but it was like a matter of managing my expectations. So I took it upon myself to see every part of the application process as its own goal that I could celebrate. So like writing my writing my um, personal statement and getting it in on time that was the first achievement like getting my first offer from another uni that was in oxford that was the second one getting inv invited to interview was an achievement in itself like going to the interview and not crying after the first one that was great too like take every single step as an achievement in itself because it is like don't focus on this end goal being getting this offer and getting in because like there are so many things to be proud of in that process before you even get there and so it meant that like by the time I'd finished my interviews I was kind of like I'm just I'm this, I had a good time like I spoke to some cool people about music if I get in I get in if I don't I don't like you know wherever the wind takes me kind of style and so I think like having that preparing yourself with that mindset makes maybe like the whole um offers day when they give the offers like a little bit less daunting it will be daunting like but a little bit less daunting because you've already sort of prepared yourself to say like i'm happy with myself i'm proud of myself already rather than like putting this immense amount of pressure on you all the way through to kind of get this offer um and then the second piece of advice from like what i would tell myself before starting i think like this you'll hear about imposter syndrome just so much and like I, de I dealt with so much imposter syndrome also because I'm the only black person that studies music in the University of Oxford so like not my year it was like everyone the whole faculty but actually um, there's a fresher coming so it'll be two of us <laughs> but it was just me and so like as much as there was this like internal imposter syndrome in terms of like not feeling you know oh, I think the discourse can very much be like click your heels and it'll be fine you just have to believe that you belong here and for me it wasn't like in tutorials I had a problem with speaking up I was very um, happy to like explain myself and express myself and communicate myself in tutorials but it was like actually realizing that there were people making me feel like an imposter. It wasn't me. It wasn't like, it wasn't me just thinking that I don't belong here. It was actually like people wouldn't talk to me. I was scared to talk to them, but they wouldn't talk to me either. Or like, you know, people would say really weird things to me in tutorials. And like, so I think it's a matter of kind of, yes, like doing things to make yourself feel comfortable in those spaces, like, going to your lectures, going to the library, enjoying the, all the things that Oxford has to offer, but also not like allowing your, yourself to gaslight yourself and say like, oh, this is not happening when it is. And if it is like, talk about it. I like express it to the people that you are close with. Like when I ended up speaking to like my tutor, who's really lovely and um, like friends that I did manage to make within the music faculty about the fact that like, this is the culture that exists 
there was able to be like more of a conversation about it so like imposter syndrome is really complicated and it's a difficult thing to deal with but there are ways to deal with it and there are like communities that are there to help you and all that kind of stuff amazing thank you all for that advice um i think that was all super helpful and thank you again for being part of this panel like i said before it's amazing to see so many former debate mate students and i just want to remind all the students watching this that this is your network debate mate alumni are here for you um, and i've spoken to everyone on this panel and they're like really happy to reach out if you want to reach out to them uh, to have a conversation. If you have any questions specific to uh, like a subject you're studying or a college you are thinking of applying to or just general life questions, the Debate Mate Alumni Network is here for you. Um, and don't be scared to reach out and ask questions. Um, but thank you all for being here today on this um, Zoom panel discussion. What I'm going to do now